And so if you don't mind, let's go ahead and turn there and let's read the first five verses of Acts as we get our minds talking about the kingdom. And so the first five verses of Acts. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when He was taken up, and He had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom He had chosen. He presented Himself alive to them after His suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, He ordered them not to depart Jerusalem, but rather to wait for the promise of the Father, which He said, You heard from Me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so here in the first five verses of the book of Acts, we have the idea of the kingdom is highlighted. And so the kingdom is a major emphasis throughout the book of Acts. And it's very hugely emphasized even throughout the Gospel of Luke. Now remember, the Gospel of Luke is the prequel to the book of Acts. And Luke talks extensively about the kingdom in his writings. Let me just listen to what I have to say here. I'll just go through a string of verses. Luke wrote in his gospel, the prequel to Acts, that he wrote the kingdom would last forever in chapter 1, verse 33. All of these are coming from the gospel of Luke. Uh, that Jesus was sent to preach the kingdom of God, chapter 4, verse 43. That Jesus emphasized the kingdom daily, chapter 8, verse 1. That he told the people to prepare for the kingdom, chapter 10, verse 9. That Jesus' earthly ministry was to prime the pump, if you will, the coming kingdom, chapter 16, verse 16. And Jesus told the disciples that they would play an integral part of that kingdom, chapter 22, verse 29. And even though the thief on the cross, we don't know how much he knew about Jesus or his teaching, but evidently he had been exposed to Jesus enough to know that he preached a kingdom because he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom in chapter 23, verse 42. And so the idea that, that Christ set up the church because the kingdom had failed is just completely um, false doctrine because you can see in Acts, as it carries over from the book of Luke, the kingdom has been emphasized throughout the Gospel of Luke. It says that Jesus emphasized it daily. Then after His death, burial, and resurrection, Jesus tells the apostles, the kingdom is coming. Get ready because it's fixing to be here. In fact, we're told that that was the focus of Jesus' teaching after His resurrection. How many days was Jesus with the apostles after He was resurrected, before He went and ascended into heaven? Forty days. What did He tell them for forty days? What did He teach them about? The kingdom, right? It says here in our chapter, in the first, the first five verses of chapter 1, He taught them concerning the kingdom. And so that was the main thing that Jesus was talking about. It's no coincidence that after Jesus leaves, seven days later, guess what becomes open to the people? The kingdom, right? The kingdom, the church. And so when you see chapter 1, it's really setting up for what we see in Acts chapter 2 about the kingdom being opened up. And so Jesus was there for 40 days preaching about the kingdom. He gave them instructions concerning the kingdom. And the apostles were to receive the Holy Spirit. Then they would open the doors of the kingdom. And here he talks about the baptism of the Holy Spirit here. And it is a unique marker of the kingdom. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Well, uh, if you read different people, they say different things, whether it's ten or seven. Um, of course, you have Passover, and then Jesus celebrated Passover in the upper room with the disciples. Uh, he was crucified, rose three days later. That's three days. He was with the apostles for 40 days after He was resurrected. That's 43, which would leave seven days to the 50th day on the day of Pentecost. Some people have said that it was 10 days, that Jesus was uh, with them for 40 days. Pentecost is 50 days afterwards. Right. And I would say it's probably 43, the fact that they've forgotten to count the three days after uh, His resurrection, if that makes sense. Uh, and, which is important, and I'll, and I'll come back to that in just a second. It's an excellent question. Excellent question. And so the baptism of the Holy Spirit is something that's become um, muddled, if you will, in the waters of religious teaching uh, for quite some time now. But it was reserved only for the apostles. And there was one other person that received the baptism of the Holy Spirit besides the apostles. Does anybody know who that was in his household? Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Now, the apostles get it in Acts chapter 2, and the kingdom is open to the Jews. Now, we get in Acts chapter 10. Why, what is the correlation between this baptism and the kingdom and being opened? The Gentiles. And so, in Acts chapter 2, we have 
Jews, the apostles, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is open to the, to the Jews. And then we get about 10 years later to Acts chapter 10, and people don't really know if Gentiles can be Christians or not. I mean, when Peter comes back and tells them what's happened, they're shocked. And so they still are not really fully convinced that Gentiles can even become Christians. And so in Acts chapter 10, as Peter is preaching to them, right, Cornelius and his household, it says that they receive the Spirit just as we have. Now what did Peter command them to do just after that? To be baptized, right? Many people will say, well, you don't have to be immersed in water because we've been baptized by the Holy Spirit. Well, the only people who are baptized by the Holy Spirit, the Bible tells us, are the apostles and also Cornelius' household, and both were baptized in water. And so if you... If, if you can have one or the other, then it makes no sense why these people, the only ones mentioned in the Bible to receive this type of baptism, did that. And so the apostles had been instructed concerning the Holy Spirit, and He would speak through them. We see that in chapters 14, 15, and 16 of the Gospel of John. They had received the Great Commission to open the keys, or use the keys that God had given them to open the kingdom, Matthew 18, 18. And they were to remain in Jerusalem until this took place, which took place a week later, the day of Pentecost. The apostles used this new indwelling of the Holy Spirit to open the kingdom up to 3,000 souls. And then the Holy Spirit opened the kingdom up to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. Any questions or comments on the first five verses of our text this morning? In Acts? No? Okay. Great. Let's look at verses 6 to 11, the ascension. And so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea, Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, they were looking on, and he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come again the same way as you saw him go up into heaven." And so here we have the ascension that takes place. And it's on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. This is a major importance and shift. Because what is the holy day in the Old Testament? Saturday. What is it today? Sunday. And so you have a group of people who observed religious importance on a particular day of the week for 1,500 years. A long time. And then all of a sudden they instantly shift to Sunday. What would you need to do for somebody to change a 1,500-year-old tradition from Saturday to Sunday? Now, think a lot of persuasion. Think about what takes place in about a 50-day time frame. I'm talking about 50 days from the crucifixion of Jesus until the establishment of the church. Jesus was resurrected on the first day of the week, Sunday. Jesus gave his final instructions to the apostles and ascended into heaven on the first day of the week, Sunday. The church was established on the first day of the week, Sunday. And the New Testament church met every first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, Sunday. And so you can see the importance that about 50 days they shift from the 1,500-year-old tradition of meeting every Saturday for the religious importance to a Sunday. And when you see what takes place within about a month and a half time frame with the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension of Jesus, the establishment of the church, and everyone meeting on Sunday, how that would take place, how that would shift. And so there are those that teach today that Christians meeting on Sunday, the first day of the week was an invention by Constantine in the 300s, the Roman emperor, and the Catholic church established that practice, are grossly misinformed, and it has no biblical basis uh, whatsoever. Um, and unfortunately, some people are still confused about Saturday or Sunday. And so, yes, Brother Charles. I, I was looking through some old calendars that I had found with my mother's And it used to be the first Sunday of the week, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Mm -hmm. In the last 45 years or so, they stayed all of them up Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Saturday. So somebody got to those people making those calendars. Yeah. It's true because sometimes you'll even ask people today who come from an unchurched background because, I mean, you don't know, because you say, what's the first day of the week? What does everybody think? 
Monday, you know, it's the first day of the work week. And, you know, sometimes it can be confusing because, like you said, on those calendars, you know, sometimes, well, no, never mind. No, calendar's day is Sunday's first, right? Okay, yeah. And so, but apparently they, it was the very end. Maybe, maybe 45 years ago they were more focused on the work week. I don't know. So that's interesting about the calendar shift. And so uh, Jesus foretells the church's trajectory. And really, chapter 1, verse 8 is an interesting text. Because it outlays, remember what I said in our introduction, Luke is good. I mean, when you look at like the writings of Mark, the writings of John, and you look at the writings of Luke, Luke, Luke is a very highly trained and skilled writer. And so Luke in verse, chapter 1, verse 8, lays for you the entire outlay of the church's growth and also the book of Acts and how it's going to unfold. And so what you have here is Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the earth. And in chapter 2, the church starts in Jerusalem. And in chapters 3 through 7, it's in Judea. And then in chapter 8, it goes to Samaria. And then in chapter 10, it goes to the outermost parts of the world. And so really in verse 1, verse 8, chapter 1, you see this trajectory of the church being foretold by Jesus before He is ascended into heaven. He left in the clouds, and one day He's coming back in the clouds. Revelation 1-7, Mark 13-26, and then when He comes back, will be the resurrection of all mankind. John 5-28, and 1 Thessalonians 4-16. And so Jesus ascends, and He will come back in the same way. Any questions on the ascension and verses 6 through 11? Yes. In verse 6, even if it's like that, were the apostles still thinking there was going to be some kind of earthly kingdom tied to Israel? Yeah, I think so. I really think they did. And so you see the misconception. And this was so ingrained in their minds. I mean, think about this. I mean, for... You can go back to, especially Moses, but even beyond Moses, all the way back to Abraham. It's just ingrained that, that God is going to set up His nation and we're going to rule. I mean, we're going to be the people. And throughout Jesus' earthly ministry, the disciples, it's not just the scribes and the Pharisees, but the disciples keep asking over and over again about this earthly kingdom. Um, in John chapter 6, 5,000 men who are of fighting age come out of the wilderness because they're ready. They're ready for this earthly king. They're ready to fight the Romans. And even after Jesus is crucified and He is resurrected and He's with them for 40 days, they're still thinking about an earthly kingdom. And think about how, how crazy that is. We look back with our 2,000 years of knowledge and knowing the Bible before us and say, how could they have been so dumb? You know, I mean, in John 19, Jesus tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. When does it change? When did the apostles stop asking that question? That's right. That's right. And that's exactly what that, that passage tells him, right? In the next few verses after 6, he says, don't worry about that. The Holy Spirit's coming, and He's going he's gonna to teach you, right? And even in John 14, 15, and 16, as Jesus is going to the cross that night, well, he's going to the, to the garden, he's going to be betrayed and go to the cross the next day. He says, there's some things that i got to teach you, but you can't bear it right now. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to lead you into all truth. And I think that's one of the things that, because after they receive the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, that never becomes a question ever again. And any of the apostles writing about the earthly kingdom. Great, great question. Any other questions or comments? No? Great. All right. Jesus' family, verses 12 through 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, about a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they, had taken, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, and Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James, all these were with one accord and were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers." And so here we have Jesus' family. And so a Sabbath day's journey to the upper room was about 0.6 miles. Now the interesting thing is, this is the same upper room as The Passion. Um, what is The Passion? It's not a movie by Mel Gibson. It is, but it's different, right? He, what, is, what is Passion? That term, what does it mean? It means the last, last few days of Jesus' life, the suffering, where the passion is suffering. Um, and so 
It's the same upper room that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. It's the same upper room that Jesus washed the disciples' feet in John 13. And so they go to the Mount of Olives. Um, they are there. Jesus ascends into heaven. And they go back to the upper room where they were with Jesus. This is probably the same room where the disciples were there and the doors were locked and Jesus appeared before their midst. And so it's interesting to see how prevalent this upper room is, especially in the Gospel of John and uh, Gospel of Luke, I'm sorry, and the very first start of Acts. And so they're here. A Sabbath day journey was about 0.6 miles. Under the um, Jewish tradition, it was about how far you could walk without violating the working laws on the Sabbath. Now, is this um, a scriptural thing? No, but it was a Jewish tradition that they did. So Luke is just, Luke's not even a Jew. He's just saying it's about a Sabbath day journey. Um, so it's about 0.6 miles. And so uh, all 11 remaining apostles are mentioned. They're together, and they're there in unity. The unity mentioned there is on Thanksgiving and prayer. Uh, thanksgiving in both petitions. And so they're praying to God. The Greek words there said that they are praying both thanksgiving, Lord, thank you so much. And they're also prayers of petitions, Lord, help us so much. And so oftentimes in our own prayer life, it should probably sound something like that too, a balance between thanksgiving and petitions. Uh, prayer is a major emphasis in Luke. Luke writes more about prayer than any other New Testament writer. Okay? Class, who writes more about prayer than anybody else in the Bible? Luke. That's exactly. Look at you guys. Did your homework. I'm proud of y'all. All right. Luke writes more about prayer than any other New Testament writer in the New Testament. I mean, Luke emphasizes prayer even when mentioning things that take place in his Gospels where prayer is not mentioned by the other synoptic writers. Luke mentions the fact that during this, Jesus was praying. Jesus told the disciples to pray. Prayer is always prevalent in the book of Luke. And Luke was a travel companion of Paul. I mean, who's a close second to, to the writings of Luke who writes about prayer in the New Testament? Paul. Who is a travel companion of Paul? Luke. All right? So does Luke write so much about prayer because he's influenced by Paul, the second most writer? Of I don't know. Okay? Uh, but Luke writes a lot about prayer. And so it's prevalent throughout the book of Acts. You see uh, people praying at different times throughout the book of Acts. Some prayers are even recorded in the book of Acts that we'll see, like in chapter 4. Um, and, you know, even the conversion story of Paul. Uh, prayer is highlighted in that passage. And so... Um, Jesus' family did not believe him during his earthly ministry. His mother, his brothers did not believe him. John 7 verse 5 tells us this. But they came to believe. And here we see in chapter 1 that they are believers now. What happened? What do you think happened that made them change from unbelief to belief? Resurrection. It's exactly what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. It says it was, it was the resurrection. They had seen him on the cross die. They had laid him in a tomb. And they saw him there for a month and a half, walking, talking, eating. Um, that, that was all they needed to see was the resurrection. And so Jesus' brothers, uh, especially James and Jude, will play an important role in the early church. And will even go on to write an epistle, an inspired epistle uh, each. And so it's interesting to see that Jesus is, and I, I say here that Jesus' family is finally unified. Because when you look at the New Testament, when Jesus is asked about his family, who does Jesus say his family is? Disciples. disciples. Yeah. yeah, the disciples. He says, here are my mother and my brothers. And the book of Luke, Jesus is walking. And a woman says, blessed is the mother that bore you. You know? And what does Jesus tell her? If I remember? I'm putting you on the spot, I know. If I remember? Somebody's trying to praise his mom. He says, blessed are those who hear the word of God or will of God and do it. And so even then he deflects, right, to spiritual matters. But thankfully now his family is unified. His spiritual and physical family are both unified as his spiritual family. And so any questions on Jesus' family in verses 12 through 14? No? Okay. Uh, verses 15 through 20. Judas's fate. So let's read that passage together. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in about all 120. And he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas 
who became a guide for those who, were arre who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and, fa and falling headlong he burst open in the middle, and all of his bowels gushed out. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called, in their own language, Akadama, which is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let, him, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office." And so here we have Judas' fate. And according to Matthew 27, verses 4 through 5, how did Jesus die? It's one of those easy Sunday school questions nobody wants to answer. I get that. How did. Was that? He wasn't crucified. No, Judas. That's right. He fell face forward. And Matthew 27 says he did what? He hung himself, right? And so he hung himself. He fell and burst forward, so evidently, um, evidently he hung for so long that nobody wanted to claim the body and it began to rot. Maybe the uh, limb broke, maybe the rope broke. We don't know what he hung himself with, but evidently his body had decomposed enough to when he hit the ground, you know, he burst forth. And so trying to gain something, he lost everything. So Judas hanged himself in Matthew 27. Of course, we know that story, but he tries to go and give the money back to the priest. The priests don't want it back. They say it's blood money. And so he goes away and he's sorrowful. And uh, this was to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah chapter 11, verse 12, which talks about them going out and taking the pieces of silver and going and buying a field uh, for the destitute and for um, the homeless, basically. And so Judas was trying to gain something by betraying Jesus, and yet he lost everything. He didn't get his money. He didn't get the property. He didn't get anything. I mean, he basically died by himself with no one to retrieve the body. And they took the, the field he was in, bought it, and made it a potter's field. Now, what is a potter's field? Right, it's where you bury homeless people or people with no money. They don't have enough money for, for a burial or a grave, or they're homeless and have no one to claim them, and so that's where they're buried. And so here, uh, Judas himself basically becomes homeless without anything and is, uh, is buried. And so, yes? Yeah, I think it's a great question. In fact, a question somebody else asked me just last week after services. And I really, when you think, being sorry is not repentance. And I think the, the gospel writers show us this here with the difference between uh, Judas and, of course, the other person that betrayed Jesus, and that is who? Peter, right. And so here you have both men, right? There are two different situations. I mean, one betrays him for money to gain something, subverts, supplants what he's trying to do and hands him over to the people that are trying to kill him. Well, the other one denies Jesus three times in the courtyard of the high priest around a charcoal fire with Jesus being just merely feet away, being on trial. And so uh, they both go away sorrowful. Uh, for Judas, he is upset what he's done. He goes back to the chief priest and the scribes. He throws the money, says, I'm so sorry. And they say, what's done is done. You know, we're not taking the money back. And he goes out, he's sorrowful. He hangs himself. Well, with Peter, Peter goes out. He's sorrowful, but he doesn't do something drastic like ending his own life. He waits. He goes back to his uh, spiritual family, if you will, with the disciples. They all go fishing together. They're trying to... Uh, encourage one another, and then Jesus kind of reinstates him as an apostle there in John chapter 20 and chapter, chapter 21 on the banks of the sea right there over breakfast. And so I think it's important for us to realize that being sorry for what you've done is not repentance. Just like if you, um, okay, you have somebody who does something wrong. I mean, we could just, we just somebody name something that's wrong. Steal. Okay. All right. And so somebody steals something. And you say, you know, you shouldn't have done that. And they say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And maybe they are sorry. Maybe they're sorry. They're embarrassed. You know, they know it's wrong. They shouldn't have done it. But next week they go out and do the exact same thing. And they may have been truly sorry in that moment. Now, some people say they were just sorry they were caught. Well, well maybe. But sometimes like, people really are sorry they do things that are wrong. But they don't change. And so the sorrowfulness there, being sorry is not repentance being sorry and changing is and so 
Um, here, unfortunately, instead of being sorry and changed, Judas basically was sorry and just threw the towel and said, I don't, I don't want to try to reconcile this situation. I just think it would be easier just to give up, if you will. So, great question. Yeah, and you have to bear fruits in keeping with repentance, right? I mean, that's part of it. Being, being sorry is good. The Bible tells us that godly, godly sorrow is a good start, um, but it can't end there. It's got to go on to something else. Great questions, great questions. All right, the last five verses of our text, verses 21 through 26. So one of the men who had accompanied us during all that time, that is, the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day in which he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Bersabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go into his own place. And they cast lots for them, and they fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And so here, the number 12 is symbolic. And here, Peter points back all the way to the prophecy made by Peter back in the book of Psalms 109, verse 8. And so he says there needs to be 12. The Bible says there's going to be 12. Judas um, needs to be replaced. Why did Judas need to be replaced? Fill the prophecy, number one. But Judas had become disqualified. How? Was it by his death? Many people say, well, he died, he had to be replaced. That's not true. His betrayal, right? His apostasy. By betraying Christ, he need to be replaced. And so it comes to Matthias. There are 120 disciples who are with the 11 apostles. So a pretty good sized group, but only two men meet the qualifications. What are the qualifications? Been with Jesus from his baptism? To his resurrection. That's over three years. There's two men who meet those qualifications, right? One of those is Matthias, and lots fall on him. Uh, if there had to be 12 apostles, why is Paul an apostle? Makes 13. But doesn't that mess the number up in the prophecy? He could. Could. It's a good answer. I would go a little bit further than that, and I would say that when Jesus talks to the twelve apostles, He says, you will sit on twelve thrones and you will judge the twelve tribes of Israel. Right? And so you have twelve apostles commissioned with sending the gospel to the nation of Israel. And then in Acts chapter 9, you have Saul, who is converted, who is a Jew himself, but he is the apostle to the the Gentiles. He says that exact thing in Romans eleven thirteen. 13. He says, I am an apostle to the Gentiles. And so here you have these 12 who are the apostles to the Jews, but then you have Paul who's converted into Acts chapter 9 to be an apostle to the Gentiles. And when is the kingdom open to the Gentiles? Not the Gentiles. Not the Gentiles. All right, Acts 9, you've got the conversion of Paul. Paul's a, Paul's a Jew. He's not a Gentile. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. When does the church become open to the Gentiles? Yeah, in Acts chapter 10. It's true, and those keys were open, but it took about 10 years to get the Gentiles. But the church was open for the Gentiles from day one. It just didn't happen until Possibly. We don't know because no Gentiles were converted in that time frame. And it, and, but we see that the apostle to the Gentiles is converted in Acts 9. The church has its first Gentile convert in Acts 10. It's not a coincidence. Those two things are back to back. 
Paul, the Gentile, the Apostle of the Gentiles, the Gentiles becoming converted in Acts 10. Of course, no, that happens by Peter, but it's setting the stage for what happens in Acts chapter 11. Okay, and so the Lot chooses Matthias. We don't know anything about Matthias. He's never mentioned again in the New Testament. Uh, tradition holds that he uh, preached the gospel for decades, and he died somewhere around the Black Sea in modern-day uh, Turkey, Armenia, and uh, Georgia. And so our four takeaways, and I apologize for going so fast, but our time was a little short today. The first takeaway is unity. Jesus emphasized the importance of unity, and Luke commented that the apostles were with one accord. And so being unified, no matter what we have to face, helps us in the face of whatever task God has given us. The second thing is, is prayer. Uh, Luke writes more about prayer than any other uh, New Testament writer. Uh, prayer was an integral part of Christ's life, but also the disciples. I mean, they're fixing to be tasked with a heavy job. They pray. In Acts chapter 4, after they get out of prison, they pray. And so prayer has got to be an important part of our life if we're going to stay faithful and if we're going to have the right attitude and be spiritually ready to take care of what God has given us. Third thing is we've got to study the Word. If you look at chapter 1, so many times you'll see throughout the book of Acts, they continually quote from the Old Testament. And they're always doing things because the Word says. It's important for us to realize that our main authority in this life as a Christian is the Word. And if we don't know what it says, we don't know what to do. And so through inspiration and through the Word, Peter knew what to do. Many times people don't know what to do spiritually, not because they're not good people or they have impure motives. They just don't know what to do. And so we've got to know the Word, to study it, then share it with others. And the fourth thing is the importance of the kingdom. It was the mission of Christ to purchase it through His blood, Acts 20, verse 28. It was the purpose of the apostles to open it, Matthew 18, 18. And it's our responsibility to be a part of it ourselves, Hebrews 12, 28. And so um, thank you so much for class today. We had, yes? That's right. And so, that's right. And so, that wall was hard to break down. And even looking at books like Galatians, even after the wall was broken down, some people still had a hard time doing it themselves. And so, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. If you don't mind, let's go ahead and close in, in a short prayer. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for your word and for the inspiration it gives to our lives. We're so thankful for uh, the church that was established through the apostles of the day of Pentecost. Dear Heavenly Father, please help us to have the same type of attitude these men had as they continually try to stay unified in their love for you, how they always continued in prayer each and every day, how they always strove to study your word and know what your will was and to apply it in their lives, and the fact that they loved the kingdom and wanted to serve it with their lives. And help us as Christians to do the same thing, and help us to share that word with others in this community and those around us, that they too can know the power of the kingdom. As in your name we pray. Amen.